Hello Greta, so the last time in this particular week. Um, this is the third video of um, the lesson that we have to cover this week and it's past paper examples still having to do with the differentiation of e to the power of x and lin of x. Um, now, you need to understand that the differentiation of e to the power of x and lin of x is brand new to the syllabus. They actually changed the syllabus in 2019. So in 2019, it was the first year that they actually asked this differentiation of e to the power of x and lin x in the final exam. So unfortunately, there are not a lot of past paper examples to do. So I went and I looked just at the 2019 paper, and we're going to work through those examples. But I will also go and, as additional practice, I will go and find some additional examples, not necessarily from past papers, but just so you can practice. There is at least lots of good examples in the homework exercises, so I do suggest that you go and look at those homework exercises in order to see what they can potentially do here. So looking at the 2019 IB paper, and this was the paper, and we're specifically going to look at two questions. The first question is question 9, and the second question is question 10. In question 9, they say, consider the function fx is equal to x times the lin of x minus the square root of x squared plus 4, where x is greater than 0. Given that f is continuous at every value in its domain, justify why f has at least one root on the interval x is an element from 1 to 5. And you look at this and you go, okay, this kind of seems familiar. And if you look at the next question, you'll understand why this seems familiar. Because... This is, in fact, a Newton-Raphson question. And normally with a Newton-Raphson question, we use Newton-Raphson to find zeros or roots. Now, if I want to prove that this particular function has at least one root, and I did show you guys how to do this, but hopefully, and hopefully you remember, um, but if you don't remember, I'll discuss it with you guys again. So if I want to go and I want to prove that there's a root, then I want to prove that there's a zero for this particular function. So the function is f of x is equal to x lin of x minus the square root of x squared plus 4. And they want me to prove that on the interval x is an element from 1 to 5, there's at least one root. So in order for there to be a root, there's got to be a zero. And in order to be there zero, the graph has to go either from negative, so if I just draw a small little Cartesian plane there, the graph has to go from negative below the x-axis to positive above the x-axis. Or it might have to go from positive above the x-axis to negative below the x-axis. So the whole idea, if I want to establish this root, then I'm going to have to work out the f of 1 and see what value that gives me. And I'm going to have to work out the f of 5 to see what value that gives me. So let's do that first. And since I'm going to pretty lazy, I'm going to go and I'm going to use my table function, so I don't have to type this in twice. So, f of x is equal to x lin of x minus the square root of x squared plus 4. I press equal and I start at 1, I end at 5, and I step in 4, so that it doesn't give me all the in-between values, it just gives me the f of 1 and the f of 4, so I step in 4. So the f of 1 right there is going to be equal to minus 2,24, rounded off to two decimal places. And the f of 5 is equal to 2,66, rounded off to two decimal places. So that is exactly what I wanted. I wanted to check that the f of 1 has got a negative y value, so it's below my x-axis. So it starts below the x-axis. The f of 5 then goes positive, so it's above. So somewhere it's got to cut that x-axis, which means it's got to have a root. So I can then go and I can say, therefore, um, f of the graph of f, let's write it out like that, the graph of f cut the x-axis. And that is between x equal to 1 and x equal to 5 which means it does have a root somewhere between those two values. Now if I look at 9.2, 9.2 then says, use the newton raphson iteration to find this particular root. You should use an initial guess of x equal to 1. So that obviously is my x0. So we're going to have to go and say x0 is equal to 1. They specified for us to use that. Show the iterative formula you use. Show your first two approximations. 
and give your answer correct to five decimal places. So I'm going to come back later to this and I'm going to use this as a checklist, making sure that after I've answered the question that I've done everything that they require. So in order to use that newton raphson iteration, I need to find the derivative of that function. And this is why this question involves the derivative of my lin x. So the derivative is then going to be equal to, now watch out for this one. This one is a product rule. So product rule says the derivative of x is 1 times the function lin x plus x times this function's derivative. So it's x times the derivative of lin x, which is 1 of x. And we'll simplify that just now. Then over here, this one is minus the square root of x squared plus 4. So if you recall, this is going to be minus to the power of a half, because a square root is to the power of a half of x squared plus 4. So this is going to be um, a chain rule. So I'm going to have to use the half and then that x squared plus 4 to the power of negative a half, and then running out of space here, but the derivative of the inside function is then going to be 2x. So there we go. That's then the derivative of that particular function. I'm just going to clean it up so it's a little bit easier to use. So I've got lin x, and look at that, x times 1 over x is just 1. And then there I've got minus, now you'll see that if I multiply a half by 2, it's obviously going to be equal to 1. So I've got x over there, and you can go and you can use that square root if you want, saying it's x squared plus 4 because it's to the power of negative a half. So you can just clean that up. It might be easier to use in that newton raphson iteration. So looking at my checklist, they said use an initial guess of x equal to 1. So I'm going to say set x0 equal to 1. That's the first one. Then they say, show the iterative formula that you're going to use. So the iterative formula I'm going to use, and I'm going to say that the first value is going to be equal to, and I have to start at x0, there we go, minus, and then if you recall newton raphson the formula is on the formula sheet over there, it says x0, or xr in this case, minus the function divided by the derivative of the function. So the function is then equal to that x0 lin of x0 minus the square root of x0 squared plus 4, so that's the function, divided by the derivative of the function, which I have over here. So the lin of x0 plus 1 minus x0 over the square root of x0 squared plus 4. There we go. So that's the iterative formula I'm going to use. And the nice thing about using this iterative formula is I can then immediately show what the value of x1 is. Now, they wanted you to show the first two approximations. So they want you to work out x1, and then I'm also going to work out x2. They don't want a third approximation, so finally, I will then go and just get my final answer, and that needs to be correct to five decimal places. So... On my calculator, I will start by saying x0 is equal to 1, so I'll put 1 into the memory. I'll press equal over there. And now I need to type all of that in there. And each time you hit that x0, remember you have to use the answer function. So I'm going to go and say answer minus answer lin of answer minus the square root of the answer squared plus 4. And then moving into the denominator, it's lin of the answer plus 1 minus the answer over the square root of the answer plus answer squared plus 4. So answer squared plus 4. So I'm hoping this is correct. Um, if it's not correct, it's not going to converge. So that's very, very important. If you don't see a convergence within like five presses of the button, you know you did something horribly wrong. So I press equal. And I get, as x1, I get this value. I'm just going to press the SD button. So 5, 5, 0, 5, 0, 4, 5, 5, 0, 4, 5, 0, 8, dot, dot, dot. Press the equal button again. And it gives me, taking its time, I see, 3, 4238. 3, 4, 2, 3, 8, 1, dot, dot, dot. 
Now, I'm going to press this a couple of times, and this is the second time, so let's see. Third time, getting closer. Fourth time, fifth time, and it looks like we're already there. Let's just double check. It's ending with a four, five at the end there, so I'll press equal again. Yep, it's already converged. So the moment you get it to converge after about five presses, you know you've got the correct answer. So correct to five decimal places, it's 3,23903. And that was using the newton raphson method in this, the derivative of the lin of x. Right. Now the next question that they had in this past paper, question 10, said... Consider the diagram below where a rectangle is formed in the first quadrant. Now, again, hopefully this should look familiar to you guys because I recorded a video for you for the previous lesson that spoke about um, optimization, maximum and minimum problems. And you're going to see just now, right over here, when we read through it, they're going to talk about that maximum. Okay, so consider the diagram below where a rectangle is formed in the first quadrant. The bottom left corner is placed on the origin, so the bottom left corner is on the origin there, while the top right corner is placed on the curve y is equal to e to the power of negative x. So this is the curve y is equal to e to the power of negative x. Okay, calculate to three decimal places the maximum area of this rectangle that can be achieved by placing it in this way. So obviously we want to go and maximize the area. And I spoke to you guys in that previous video where I said, whatever we're trying to maximize, I need a formula for that. So I'm going to go and I'm going to start by saying it's the area of a rectangle. So a rectangle is going to be length times breadth. Now, the length of this particular um, rectangle, if you think about it, is going to just be my x value. Because as this moves on and on and on and on, the length is just going to be x. Now, um, oh, by the way, you could have made the breadth x. It really doesn't matter. So I know a lot of you are going, but ma'am, isn't that the breadth? It really doesn't matter. So this can be the length, this can be the breadth, or this can be the length, this can be the breadth. I'm just looking at the first of those two dimensions, and that's x. Now the other one, I'm then going to have to say length times breadth. In this case, that is the y-coordinate. And because it's the y-coordinate, it's e to the power of negative x. And this is almost exactly like that example that we did in the textbook. Um, yeah, I think it was in the textbook. I don't know if it was a past paper example or a textbook example, but in the previous video on maximum and minimum word problems, we did something very, very similar to that. So the area is then x times e to the power of negative x. And that's what I'm trying to maximize. So because I'm trying to maximize this, based on optimization, we have to find the derivative and we need to set it equal to zero because that gives me a stationary point, specifically in this case, a maximum turning point, which then optimizes that area. Okay, so I'm going to find the derivative and the derivative pretty easy and straightforward. It's product rule. So the derivative of x is 1 times e to the power of negative x plus the derivative of that function, which is e to the power of negative x. And then don't forget Chain rule, I have to multiply by the derivative of the inside function, which is negative 1. But I have to finish the product rule, which means I have to multiply by x over here. So we're setting the derivative equal to 0. And please, people, don't forget that 0. I've spoken to you guys about this um, before. If you forget the 0, it's not an equation, so you can't solve it. They will penalize you if you don't set it equal to 0. So 0 is equal to e to the power of negative x minus x times e to the power of negative x. And we've already had something similar in one of our examples. Now I'm just going to continue on the next page, just so we have a little bit of space there. So we're going to factorize, taking out that e to the power of negative x is a common factor. And we're going to say it's 1 minus x. And then we've spoken about this in the previous example where we say it's impossible for e to the power of negative x to be 0 because there's no exponent you can give that base of 2 comma 7, 1, 8 that will make it 0. So this is impossible. But 1 minus x could be 0, which means x is equal to 1. Now, they did not ask, look at the question, they did not ask for the x value that will give me the maximum area. They asked for the maximum area. 
So because they asked for the maximum area, we are going to have to sub this value back into my area formula that I've established. So the area formula that I established is over here. Area is equal to x, which in this case is 1, times e to the power of negative x, which in this case is negative 1. So that means my maximum area is going to be 1 over e, and they asked for it correct to three decimal places. So I will just quickly type that into my calculator. 1 over e, sorry, e is equal to 0, 0,368, and that's going to be in units squared. Right. So these were the examples on using differentiation of e and differentiation of the logarithmic function in last year's past paper. Thank you for listening.